So are we ready to get into the Word of God? Uh, if you came here to get motivationally spoken to, you've come to the wrong fellowship. The scriptures, now they'll motivate you all right. <laughs> but see, it's his words that are spirit and life. It's his words that shall never pass away. And I figure, we should figure that when uh, Jesus, and again, Satan, uh, decided, oh, you're the son of God, huh? All right, well, let's go ahead and let's just po see if we can push some buttons. Well, I figure that uh, when Satan came to Jesus in the wilderness to tempt him, Jesus didn't say, you know, you're hurting my feelings. No, he quoted it as written. As a matter of fact, we're going to find going into this year, and we'll talk about more and more this, some of the subject matters. Listen, the scriptures overrule feelings. But if you understand the scriptures, they'll turn your feelings. And it's by the time we're done, listen, I don't know how more motivated you would need to get than to know you are a son of the Most High God through your faith in Jesus Christ, that you are more than a conqueror. That you're an overcomer, that you're filled with his spirit. And one of the things, and we'll be told, we won't quite get into it today, but we're on, remember we started the uh, end of last year and going in this year, uh, new year, new level. New year, new level. And if we're going to move on, if we're going to get promoted, then that means more discipline, more understanding, maturity. I remember when I was 14, 15 years old going, man, I just can't wait to drive, can't wait to drive. And then the day you got the keys, well, there's a number of us this year are going to get the keys, but you're going to get them because you grew up, not because you wanted to feel better. And this year, listen, this, and he's talking to all, this so, just amazing local churches here in this area, but listen, we've got work to do. If, anybody, how many, if anybody's been in the military the first thing they do in the military is beat the daylights out of your civilian mentality. And so what we want to do is, is going into this year, new level, new year, new level. Uh, the Lord wants to give us more responsibility. But see, with that responsibility means that we're going to have to have some maturity and some understanding, right? And so uh, this year, what I want to talk about, we're going to start, uh, we, we finished up our series on fasting. How many of y'all... God did something in your life on this last fasting time. I mean, you're just, things were removed and changed and imparted. And we learned when it came to fasting, it was not your sacrifice that did anything for God. God was not interested in your sacrifice. He was interested in the change that took place when you died. And he fellowships with the change. And that's why many of you is like, wow, I saw this and God did this and God did that. He's always wanted to do that for you. You changed. You had things fall off. There were things that were added. Well, we want to kick that into a higher gear now that we finish up the fast. And again, going into the kingdom of heaven and understanding, I use this term a lot here, uh, skill set development. That walking in the kingdom is not about luck and it's not simply about education. Listen, I could give you the flight manual to the challenger that I fly around the world. It's this thick and it's written in English. And you may be able to read the English part about it, but I'm not giving you the keys. You wouldn't even know where to put them. And by the way, here's a hint. There are no keys to a jet. So it's not even education. I got to flying $35 million business jets around the world because of skill development. Skill development development. And the scriptures have been given to us, not simply, now we're supposed to grow in grace through, uh, through the knowledge of our Lord and Jesus Christ. That's how it happens. We've got to be informed. We find out who he is and what he thinks. These things were written by people that were encountered by God. These are not theories. These are not folks sitting around trying to figure out some kind of theology, sitting in a cave, sucking on peyote buds. God invaded their space. They lived to tell about it and they wrote, this is what we saw. This is what he said. This is what happened. Well, when we read the Word of God, and Kevin and Annie hit this last week, and it's huge. When we read, it's important that we read to be doers. Because folks that don't want to do the Word deceive themselves. And we're living in a, in a, in a time period to where and the people say, well, you know, there's so many people leaving the faith. I'm, I'm going to argue with you, not many, because if they never had the real faith in the first place, they didn't leave it. They weren't even walking in it. 
But see, if we're disciplined and skilled followers in the principles of the Word of God, man, that's where the good stuff is. Not just in our lives individually, but to be a blessing to others. Skill set development. Well, we're going to begin, now we do have the family, uh, like I said, the family series coming up next month, but we're going to begin to set the pace for a number of themes and a number of subjects when it comes to skill set development. And today, what we're going to do is start that this off by tur- turning this on. <laughs> Mr. Jet Pilot, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How's this thing working again? There's a lot of buttons in that thing, you know? <laughs> just, anyway. Okay. So today, and we're going to start this, we're going to really start hitting this year, discipleship, the roadmap to God starts here. The roadmap to God starts with discipleship. And we're going to talk about a number of, well, that's not right. What the, a, a better word is we're going to introduce some things. Uh, first of all, and, and again, in my review and some of the notes and stuff, uh, couple, make a couple statements to get us going. Disciples see miracles, not dabblers. I'll say that again. Disciples are not only see, but they're used in miracles, not simply followers and dabblers. And we're going to see in the Gospels regularly, there was Jesus differentiated between disciples and those who just went along for the ride to see the show. And we're going to read here in just a second when Jesus said, go into all the world and get people to like you. No, we're going to find out. No, that's not what he said. We're going to read here in just a second because I know most of you. And I hope and I trust That there isn't anybody that comes to a service here that goes, you know what? I'm just going to believe him because I think he's a great guy. I trust you're going to search the scriptures diligently to make sure I'm not lying to you. Because if we're going to be a mature church and mature sons of God, then we want to make sure, by the way, I'm not lying to you. (laughs) But that you're taking the time to develop skill sets and understand and hear the word of God. And we're going to talk, matter of fact, let's go ahead and go now. Uh, to, I'll just read it to you here in uh, Matthew 28. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. I had a question for you. Uh, What do you think the word commanded means in Greek? (laughs) Go do this. It's not optional. And my friends, we've got to go through the scriptures and find out there's a lot in there that's not supposed to be optional. And God forbid there's there's pulpits and men or women behind them decide we're just going to make things up as we go along. You weren't there when it was written. You got no business being a general editor. We're going to go into the world and see, notice what what, uh, men and women of God are meant to do. And listen, this is my job. And if you don't like the way I do my job, there's really other amazing ministers out there, but they're doing their job. And my job is to go and make disciples of the Goffstown region. The pulpit's responsibility is to create disciplined followers of the Lord so he can work with them and in them. Remember, without him, you can do nothing. You know, he really meant that. It goes with that whole union thing. We won't get into today, but listen, you are literally in union. You have been fused and there's interchange of his nature with yours right now because that's a, that's a reality of your new creation, your born again spirit. You are literally united in Christ. When you see that term in Christ, that's what that means. Our union with him, that exchange of natures. Well, because that's taken place and you're no longer your own anymore, without him, you can do nothing. I'm okay with that. Like he's really great at what he does. And there's a whole lot, my life is a whole lot more different and expanded, (laughs) mature, experientially wise as well, when I just said, you know what, (laughs) Jesus, take the wheel. You know, what's that saying? You know, if Jesus, you know, God's my co-pilot, you better switch seats. 
God, you're a co-pilot. What a stupid, stupid saying. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> I'll say it again. What a stupid saying. God, you're a co-pilot. Better switch seats, right? Notice he says, go therefore, Mr. Johnsick. Ollie, any other man or woman of God he's called through the centuries, through the ages, go therefore, all right, I've done that, and make disciples of all the nations. Done that, we got a lot more coming. Time to get back into international work and missions trips and all sorts of stuff we've done through the 28 years of the history of this ministry, okay? Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And this is what going into this year, and again, this is, we we're known as a teaching church. That's the primary office I've operated in for many, for decades, and that is a teacher. I pastor, yes, but... I teach. We're known for that. that. And I've heard so many people through the years be very grateful and say, thank you that I found a place that I can learn here and go past C spot run. And we've heard this many times before, and I've, or I've said this many times before. I know a lot of folks that sit there and say, well, you know what? You just need to keep it simple. Well, I'll tell you what, when an 18-year-old, if you've just been keeping it simple and teaching them how to eat with plastic spoons for 18 years, you've created a problem. And we're creating problems when the pulpit is not causing and teaching and expecting maturity. That's a problem. And our world's facing it. And I would contend that there's some folks that are complicit with folks leaving the faith because they were allowed to play with tinker toys while they were 18. This is a place where we're supposed to be challenged. By the way, anybody in here, um, you guys all got brains? Use them. <laughs> Do you know critically reasoning and rationalizing and meditating and dedicating and committing your mind? Well, that, what's that whole thing about loving the Lord your God with what? Oh, hey, your soul and mind are in there well as well. Oh, Jesus, I just love you. You're just so great. You're so great. You know, you're supposed to do that with your mind. You're supposed to do that with your mind. And so, uh, you know, Jesus, if we're going to follow his pattern, you now that whole thing about teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, you know, it's just amazing what happened if you just go follow Jesus and see how he taught. You know, there's just things he emphasized that a lot of us don't today. And there's things that he didn't bother with that a lot of us are just worrying all about. I'll tell you one thing that he didn't worry about is what you thought of him. He cared more about the truth. He cared more about what God was saying. Now he backed it up. He said, look, you can believe me because no one's done the works that I've done. In other words, I got some evidence to show I'm who I said I am. But he put his priority on human beings, all of creation, but specifically imagers of God, mankind, to be pleasing to God. There's responsibilities, but there's also, listen, if I'm going to love him with my whole mind, then I've got to fill it with good stuff, process it, be able to understand it, and as we just said, I don't know, was it five, six minutes ago, and be able to perform it. And so if this is going to happen, if we're going to have a New Testament style church, listen, we thank God for the gifts of the Spirit, love the medically documented miracles we've had through the years. We're not doing any, if the first century church couldn't do anything about the ministry of the Holy Ghost, we're not either. The gifts of the Spirit no longer, no more passed away with the apostles than orange trees did. It's poured out on his church, says you can't, you're not going to do anything until you receive power. We have to have power, right? But that's not all that's in there. You know, the Apostle Paul, and, I, and again, some people say, and, and, and again, I'm setting you up for this year because uh, not only just ministering the Spirit, but we're going to even more just get into some stuff. People will say, well, you know, you just need to make it simple for everybody. Did you, what did, do you remember what uh, uh, the Apostle Peter said in 2 Peter near the end? Because he was talking about the end times, and it seems like God's taken forever. And he's like, look, you better live right, because the heavens and the earth are going to melt with fervent heat. They're all toast. This is the way you should live. And then you remember what the next sentence is? You Bible scholars that go to Goffstown Harvest, if you can't raise your hand, I got more work to do. You know what was next? 
He started talking about Paul. He started talking about, he says, and our beloved Paul, he writes about these things too. And he writes some things that are hard to understand. And people that don't understand him use them to cause destruction. But understand, listen, do you know even Jesus taught and he confused tons of people? There was one time when he started talking about what appeared to be cannibalism. Eating his flesh, drinking his blood, they all took off. But here's the thing, if they would have stayed long enough, if they would have just stayed long enough, they would have heard Jesus explain to his disciples, my words are spirit and life, come on. I'm not talking about cannibalism. I'm talking about how there is no life outside of me. In the same way the sun exudes light and there is no light. The sun, you don't even know there's a sun without light and expression. We don't know the father without the expression of the sun. You don't. You can't. He's always been the outward expression and going out of the bosom of the Father. He's always done that. And so we have to understand, well, if that's the case, then there is no knowledge or experiencing God outside of the Son. And so when he says these things, we, we should probably pay attention. And if that's the case, do you know that the Son of the Most High God, when, he, when, you, when you go and you, when you read the... Um, Sermon on the Mount, parable of the sower. He already said there's people that weren't going to get it. He said, I'm going to teach him parables, and there's people, and they're going to fulfill what Isaiah said. He said, they close their eyes. They've stopped their ears. Their hearts are hard, and they're not going to turn and be healed. But guess what? Oh, by the way, benefit a disciple? He turns to his disciples and said, but it's given to you. Followers and dabblers miss out on so much. They're not capable of understanding the, way, the kingdom of God and its powers, but disciples are privy to secret information. And as for me, I want to be able to read what Paul wrote and go, got it. Got it. Not only got it, but can perform it, and he pays me to make sure you get it too. To teach you to observe all things that he said and that he's commanded. And you know, there's some commands in there that are going to be really rough on your flesh. <laughs> your uncontrolled flesh is rough on you anyway. You wake up with headaches. You wake up in the morning guilty, chained. Listen, your flesh is going to, you might as well just submit it to the cross and start reaping benefits of heaven because your flesh, you better do something with it. And so if his commandments are difficult on the flesh, sin is difficult on your flesh. It'll kill you. We talk about this during the offering regularly. I spend money better than the devil. So give me more. I'll spend it on missions and help him plant churches in Mexico. The devil will spend it on fentanyl. teaching to observe all things that he's commanded. So what I want us to see here is if I'm supposed to, and he is sent, and that means all of us, because listen, your family, if your parent, your friends, so on, this is not just limited to fivefold ministry. Get it. I'm just putting it in context uh, with, with us as a local church. But notice he said, go therefore and make disciples or disciplined followers. And this year, and we're, we're pretty good. Um, I believe the Lord is, is really pleased with this ministry, as he is with a lot of them, but I keep saying it, we're here so we can be partial to this one. But amazing, really, really great works. But I want to go deeper. I want more of God. There's still things, there's things I don't understand. There's miracles I haven't seen yet. There's skills I haven't developed yet when it comes to ministering in power. There's some I have. But I want more skill development. And that means, listen, remember when we were talking about fasting and, and when uh, uh, Jesus said this kind, because they asked Jesus, why could we not cast this devil out? And he says, well, because of your unbelief. And he said, look, if you have faith as a mustard seed, not the size of a mustard seed, meager faith has never made Jesus happy ever. If you had faith as a mustard seed, you see this mountain, speak to it, up it goes. 
He says, and nothing will be impossible to you. And as we talked about when we were talking about fasting, meaning when it came to faith and it came to fasting, fasting is not limited to demon deliverance. Fasting is about dealing with those areas of unbelief you don't even know you have until you run into it. They had had previous successes casting out devils. From chapter 10, he gave them the power to do that. By the way, yeah, we won't get into it too, too much now, but he says in Matthew chapter 10 and chapter 9, he healed all manner of sickness and disease, and he had compassion on the people. Right, they're shepherdless folks. And he says, pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers. I'm an answer to a prayer that he'd send out laborers. Can you be? And then he equipped them in chapter 10, and he, and he gave them authority over all devils and to heal all manners of sickness, all manners of disease. Yet they failed. One of the things that a disciple and a mature person will understand that it's not Jesus' fault. He came in, he healed that demon-possessed boy even when his disciples couldn't. And I've decided that, and, I, and Jesus many times he would say, be it done unto you, uh, unto you according to your faith, but not all the time. He had his ability to move in power too. And speaking of a local church, and you know, one of the things, what I was speaking out over our church, just coming in today, praying in the Holy Ghost. You pray in tongues more than any of you guys, I'll bet you. You should too. And so I'm coming in, praying in the Spirit, worshiping God, and it passed through my spirit as I was praying, and it turned over into English, and I'm declaring over Gosstown Harvest Christian Church and new names and everything else and schools we're going to have that he will be able to do mighty works here. Because remember, he was in his hometown. It says he could do no mighty work because of their unbelief. He's going to do great and mighty works here. Because we're going to be disciplined followers of the king. And if the guy or the girl next door can't get it done, we're going to get it done. So it's going to start with not blaming Jesus. If we're going to obey all that he's commanded, then we've got to obey and listen to what he said. And not one time, Mr. and Ms. Bible scholar, is there anywhere that Jesus said someone they, they, they were prayed for and they were not healed, and he said, well, it wasn't the will of God. He never said that. No. Well, Jesus was God. He tied both his hands behind his back. Yes, he is divine, was divine, but everything he did as a man, because if he didn't, he could not be our redeemer. He couldn't have been. We're going to have a really good time when we start talking about the law. Some of the most joyless people I've ever met are legalistic Christians. Amen. Well, you know not one jot or tittle is going to pass away till all is fulfilled, right? Yeah, do you know why he said that? He wasn't saying that about the law and on us. He already knew we couldn't fulfill it. He says not one jot or tittle will pass away because I couldn't redeem you from the law if anything was left out. Oh, we're going to have fun with that one. We're going to have fun with that one. Oh, my body is dead because of sin. My spirit is life because of righteousness. We're not serving in the old way of the letter, but the new ways of the spirit. You know what's kicking your butt? Is someone hasn't been able to teach you how to live out of the rivers of living water on the inside of you. To you, it's just a verse that's frustrating the daylights out of you because you don't know how to make it work. You know, the apostle Paul went into great detail on how all that works. But if someone up here does, can't make, isn't making it work in their own life, how are they going to teach you? Yeah. And so if you go to the well, you know it's there, but because you have no understanding and skill sets, then it's capped. And you'll go back to what you know naturally, and that is law. And we've illustrated, I want to get, and there's things I keep saying over and over and over again. Well, we need commandments. We need rules. We need regulations. There isn't a single person that leaves their body that wants to keep their porn, that wants to keep their drugs, 
Ask anybody that left their body to go, and those that came back, they talk about, it was all gone, which means your spirit man knows how to be holy. It knows how to walk in power. It knows how to worship. We got to deal with something with this, meaning there's a well on the inside of us that law cannot get to. It cannot. There's no access to it. So we'll have to understand some things that Jesus said because we know, and I'm very grateful, that the New Testament writers do not supersede Jesus. They explained what he was talking about. Because they have post-resurrection knowledge now. Post-resurrection knowledge. Like I said, man, that's most joyless people on the planet today are legalistic, looking for new moons, Sabbaths, festivals, don't eat, don't touch. You'll do more than those things if you learn how to live out of the inner man that craves holiness. Your inner man desires passionately to live right and to walk in power. There's a new generator. There's, a new, there's, there's more power in you than Seabrook. But if we don't understand how, it's capped. And there's folks that are smart enough, in, you're smart enough to not want to deny the word. You've learned enough, okay? I'm not going to deny what God said, but darned if I can make any of it work. As sons of God, as children of God, there's an, there aren't verses in there that we're not supposed to not only be able to understand, but also be able to walk in them. And as far as this ministry, we're not going to be afraid of verses. We're not going to be those that just pass over some because we just have no clue what it's about. Or certainly, that was for the first century church. That's like saying apple trees were for the first century church. Give me a flipping break. One of the biggest deceptions the enemy's ever pulled on the church. It's God's will. All that passed away with the apostles. No more praying in tongues. And the devil has slipped in. Through, and listen, I'm as intellectual. I'll go down as deep down the rabbit hole trails you want to go. No, rabbit hole. What's the one, Alice in Wonderland? But you want to know a Rembrandt of Satan? Rembrandt. I mean, just a Picasso masterpiece. It isn't the pentagram and the child sacrifices. It's coming into the very heart of the church and say, put down your weapons. God doesn't want you to have those weapons anymore. Put them down. Those passed away because they were for special people. The only problem with that is Peter himself rebukes that stupidity. And he says, why do you look at us as if by some manner of godliness or holiness we made this man whole? It was the name of Jesus. And faith in his name and the faith that comes through him that made this whole. Are you going to tell me the name of Jesus passed away with the apostles? Faith in his name, did that pass away with the apostles? No, these are laws. I fly at 41,000 feet because there's laws. And it works every time. I can be thinking about the Red Sox. I really don't think about them or the Patriots that much anymore either. But... (laughs) I do get some really good worship in that high. But do you, you know an atheist can make that thing fly just as much as I can? Because there's laws. The scriptures, the, the kingdom of heaven, when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's opening our eyes to laws that will supersede natural ones. They supersede them. They'll overrule them. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus overrules the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death has not gone anywhere. You can give in to it anytime you want. But if we understand Romans 6, 7, and 8, which is not the topic of today, we'll get there. Then you understand there's a greater law generating on the inside of you. And your body, sin, may want to extend its passions through your members, but it's just going to get so darn frustrated to the believer that knows he's dead and he was crucified with Christ. That is not a positional saying. That is a fact of what happened to you in Christ. Isn't it amazing how much you can get out of one text? (laughs) One of the things that I talked to you about before, I'm giving myself more over to, um, again, I love to teach and presentation. I work really, really hard. This is actually going to be very simple. I want to give myself over more to just going. 
just going. I'm very comfortable with it anyway. You can open the Word of God right now, anywhere, open it up, and I can teach you. I've been at this a long time. But you know, teaching and lessons and going to a local church, it should be about school and about training, but as well, in particular on Sunday morning, um, we want to have the best bet of get any, getting anybody wherever that they're at at any time so that we can increase the percentages of people leaving going, how did he know that? They were just, he, he was just talking right to me. Well, I've enjoyed the outlines and the script, but we're going to free some things up a little bit and just, if we don't get done on something today, we'll just start next week. I don't care. I want maximum return, right? I mean, plus we're here until 1.30 anyway, right? <laughs> Who said two? Was that you, Anthony? Who the man? No, I'm just kidding. All right. So let's, let's keep going. And Jesus told his disciples, so, okay, so what we want to do is let's, let's start talking about discipleship, all right? We're setting the stage. A disciple is a disciplined, mature follower. And we'll talk about, there's, listen, there's genuine benefits that a disciple has that followers and dabblers won't. Uh, dabblers, followers, um, roll the dice, a disciple is someone who's skilled in the laws of the kingdom of heaven. And I don't mean laws about how much makeup to wear. I'm talking about laws like there's spirit realm laws as much as there's gravity laws, as much as there's laser laws. There's spirit realm laws that a disciple is giving his or her life to understand and know that Jesus said, look, I'm freely giving you this stuff. Freely give it, right? Okay. So let's talk about some things. Then Jesus told his disciples, Matthew 16, 24, 29, he told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, say anyone. anyone. What does anyone do you think mean in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic? Anyone. Okay, is there anybody in here that's an anyone? Yeah. We're all anyones. So again, this is Christianity 101. Okay. Is there anybody in here that has made a decision that said in their heart, I want to follow Jesus. Yes. All right? Yeah. Okay, great. You know, he's going to tell us how to do it. And there's no exception. <laughs> there's no exception. He says, if anyone, so I want to follow Jesus. Jesus loves me. This I know. Darn straight. Absolutely right. And he's going to, oh, by the way, <laughs> if you want to follow Jesus, shouldn't he be able to be the one to tell you how you're going to do it? Not you, your preferences, your culture. See, if we regard nobody according to the flesh, what he was saying is one of the hardest things it seems to get Christians to understand is they are spirit beings that just happen to live in a body. But you're spirit beings. We're, we're spirits. Our inner man, we, we're going to live forever. And so if that's the case, then his nomenclatures and terminologies are going to supersede simply what our, just what our bodies want and what this material realm said. So, well, you know what? Are you telling me to deny reality? Well, I don't know. Jesus walked on water. What do you call that? <laughs> oh, there's that whole Bible thing again. Don't you hate when I do that? <laughs> no, I'm not denying reality. Jesus, when he's presented a kingdom, said there's more reality out there. Yeah. Professor, physicists get it, right? Physicists get it. They get that even though you can't see, there's all sorts of quarks and quantums and all sorts of crazy stuff you can't even see that make things work. Well, just, we know it's the second, third heaven. That the things that are seen are not made of those things that are seen, but those that are unseen, which means they instigate. And that means if Jesus is the one who put the, all this clay stuff together, he knows how to manipulate and bob and weave and walking on water was like walking on the cement right now. Didn't phase him at all. You mean to tell me there's laws out there? Absolutely. Because if it was God's will, if it was a special dispensation for Peter to walk on water, why did he get upset with him when he, didn't, when he stopped believing? He had no right getting upset at Peter if this was not something he was supposed to understand. No right. Matter of fact, he has no right getting upset at any of us if he's going to say, what? what are 
where's your unbelief coming from? What are you doing? If he didn't expect, oh, and as well, well, you know, you know, faith and power, that's about church. Last time I checked, they weren't in church walking on waves, man. They weren't in church. When Jesus cursed the fig tree and killed that, that wasn't in church. There's powers that are all around us. I don't use flying. Now, like the aviation has been a great part of this ministry and stuff, but, and it's used for the gospel, but it doesn't have to be. There's lo- Gravity works whether you're in church or whether you're on Mount Everest. You mean we can discover these powers? Absolutely. Back to the creator of all things. If, if the creator, the designer, the expression of the Father who proceeds out of the Father, like the light comes out of the sun, says, you want to follow me? I want you to follow me. Like, that's why I came. I want you to. But if you're going to, you got to understand this. Watch this. If anyone's going to come after me, first principles. You know, there's a law. As I've been a flight instructor for 20-something years now, 25 years. And when they talk about the laws of learning, psychological different laws of learning and what's important, the very first principle they teach you is the law of primacy, meaning you, the first things you say, you better have it right because they're the hardest things to unlearn later. The law of primacy, according to Jesus, first things first, Deny yourself, take up your cross. Deny yourself and take up your cross. So how many, listen, when G, and you're going to find out now, well, many will come to me on that day and says, well, did we not do this in your name? Did we knew? Just because you put his name on it doesn't mean he was behind it. There's a whole lot of people during the Inquisition that put his name on things. He had nothing to do with. And I guarantee you, they qualify for that verse. Well, did we not do this in your name? Well, you put my name on it, but I wasn't involved in any of it. That's why it's nonsense arguments. People, especially in the Old Testament, wow, you know, you saw how evil God and God just blew everybody up. Two things. Number one, critically reason for it. He also blew up Israel when they were idiots too. He was no respecter of persons. And he just thought you shouldn't be nations that burn your children alive offering to Moloch. He just thought we probably should put an end to that kind of stuff. So if you need to toast a nation because you're burning children alive, I'm okay with that. But as well, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, when the apostle Paul was saying, look, when he was doing about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he said, the eye is not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. He was quoting Isaiah. Eye is not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man. It hasn't happened. You can't stop at that verse because the next verse, Paul says, but God has revealed them to us by the Spirit. Meaning, the old, most, part, most of the Old Testament is cryptic. You can't understand it outside of New Testament revelation. So when someone tries to, when Oprah gets on TV and starts talking about how bad God was in the Old Testament, things were hidden. You didn't understand what was going on until now that Christ is coming. You can stand back and go, I get it now. Now I can get it. What a privilege we have to live in this age. So don't go back and try to live like you're under the old covenant. We're privileged to be in this age, but we're also responsible for the knowledge of this age. First principles. If anybody come after me, I can stop right there and let you just sweat until next Sunday. <laughs> no, but you're not. We still got two hours to get to 1.30. Oh, I'm just kidding, you new people. 12.45. <laughs> if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever, now watch this. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person. Anybody in here in each? So the Lord is being very clear with us. That there is a day coming, I don't care what theologians or new age kind of people want to say, there is a judgment coming and we are going to give an account for the deeds done in our body. The Apostle Paul said, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we aim to be well-pleasing 
to him. Now, thank God for the blood and grace. But make no mistake, what he's doing is he's telling you the only way you're going to survive that event when I judge you is you start here and you lose your life in me. When Jesus was talking about losing our lives for him, taking up our cross, he says this, he goes, um, which of you, you want to build a house, uh, which of you think you're going to have enough materials to build that thing? Or I know, let's use another illustration, you know what, you're going to go to war, and you've got X amount of toy soldiers that are going to go against this X amount of toy soldiers. And you're going to have to figure out, can I take these guys with these? And you go, oh my gosh, if I can't, I better go and start doing some negotiating. In other words, what he's saying is the building materials you need to finish your race do not even begin until you lose your life in him. Because you can do nothing without him. The building he's working in us as members of the body of Christ is an eternal house. And it's an eternal building that he can possess through his spirit. Remember, we understand a lot of these things now because of the, the Pauline writings and P the New Testament writings. But listen, he knew where that was going to go. So what he's saying is, is, I'm bringing you to a place to where you have to understand, I didn't create, get, please get this. Here's one of the laws you must understand about his creation. Are you listening? There's no such thing in the kingdom of God called independence. Oh my God, that'd be a good meme, wouldn't it? Let's get that on there. Get a picture of me. Here, okay. One more? Okay. <laughs> the Lord has never created anything to be independent of him. His creation, every part, listen, he, the numbers of your head are numbered. He knows when a bird falls out of the sky. He doesn't create for independence. He creates for animation. Get that one down. No, come on, get the camera out. Come on. Sorry. You write that down. I'll take the picture. Okay, ready, go. <laughs> Creation is not about independence, but animation. The Lord animates through his creation. He doesn't create anything to be self-willed. Well, then why did he give us a free will? Because you don't have things like love and devotion without a free will. But notice that the folks that get rejected and can't hang out with him are the ones that do I will instead of you will. And I'm just kind of figuring Jesus... Yeah, that's, not, that's kind of like an arrogant picture. I'm just kind of figuring... That if Jesus said, I have not come to do my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me, I think I'm going to take it from the Master. Yeah. But see, I can tell you why he said that. You know why I know he said? It's, it shouldn't, it's no big deal. When he said, I only do the will of the Father who sent me, is the same as the light saying, I only emit because the Son is emitting me. He had, if he was going to be the very image of God, that means there can't be a speck out of line. He can't have a speck that's out of line with the Father, or he immediately now cannot be the image of the invisible God. He cannot. And so if he's going to be the image of the invisible God, there can't be anything about him that is not submitted. But he takes his will, which is free devotion, uh, devotion of the Father, gives it to him. Therefore, the Father animates him fully. Philip, don't you know if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. Church, world's supposed to say, we're supposed to be able to say to them, don't you know if you've seen me, you've seen the Messiah. Because the body of Christ is to Jesus what light is to the Son and what Jesus is to the Father. Well, I don't believe you. Just read the book of Acts, will you? Just look and see what they looked like. And they demonstrated God on earth. They weren't God on earth, but they were in union. 
And they were the expression of the second person of the Godhead on the earth. Back to, he's very, this is very reasonable. And if you critically reason it, you'll go, yeah, that's absolutely right. If you're going to follow me, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. He's either God or he's not. I'm letting that sit there. Because we have to settle. If we're going to be a disciple, he's God. He's my eldest brother. He's not ashamed to call me his brother. He calls me. He says, I'm not calling you servants anymore. Now I'm calling you friends. He says, the glory that I've had with the Father, I want you to I'm going to build a place for you so that you can come and see me in the glory. I can't wait for you to see me. That's why we'll honor him in this place. We can, to whatever degree on earth, we can see him and be with him. But with all of those benefits, let's not forget, he's God. Period. And if he's God, he's the boss. I'm glad he's benevolent. But he's God. And so to deny myself and take up his cross, and that is simply meaning, listen, Mark Twain is attributed with saying the two most important days in a person's life are the day, A, they're born, and B, the day they figure out why they're born. You want to follow him, two things. He's God, you do what he wants. B, you find out what position, what place you have in him. He, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And there's a design, there's a gift, there's a calling. And listen, business is as much as a calling as a pulpit. I get to do both. They're callings. But they're a result of going hungry, hungry for God, missing some meals and saying, I have to have you or I'm going to die. I, have, I was just doing it last night. I had to ask God this morning, please forgive me for yelling at you, but I meant everything I said. I want you. Do not frustrate me. I have to be in the presence of the living God. Well, Pastor, that's easy for you to say. I, look at how blessed you are. I wasn't when I was in my 20s. We were going hungry. Almost lost our house multiple times. Don't look at me at 60 and go, yeah, you got it made. I didn't for 20 years, but I found my cross. I found my cross, and it hurts like heck to get up on that thing. But the end result of the cross is resurrection, and resurrection life's really, really, really good. Half your problem is trying to have a resurrected life, and you never got crucified. You know, I'm like overloading you guys with some really great statements. Man, it was so good you were here today. Ask me. And that's been a frustration for a lot of folks is they want, they read the results of a resurrected life without understanding the crucified life. When we start hitting the Apostle Paul and how he glorified in the death of the Lord Jesus. During the fasting series, I made mention multiple times. Well, what did Paul say about power? What did he say about moving in miracles? Did, did he say faith? Meditating the word? No, death. I carry about in my body the death that Jesus experienced, that the life of Jesus would be manifested through me. We're going to fall in love with the grave. Because he told me on the fast, he says, the tomb is the end of weakness for the believer. Because you didn't stay there. But you don't get the glory without the crucifixion. And he says, if you're going to follow me, if you want to come after me, then you're going to deny yourself and you're going to jump up on that thing and you're going to let me as God tell you why you were born. And then you, you're, we're going to get walking together. How many of you all know he's got a promised land for everybody, but you're going to go through your wilderness first. You're going to get to go through your wilderness. You're going to have to. But on the other side of that, listen. Um, 
I can't tell you how amazing it is to know that I don't wake up at all going, I wonder what I'm supposed to do today. I don't deal with that. And even when I was in my 20s and we had two children, Bible school, working four jobs, still have three jobs in our house right now, even back then, I still didn't have to get up and go, I wonder what I'm going to do with my life. Why? Because I knew I had to go to the cross. I knew if I went to the cross, he would take care of the rest. The Apostle Paul said this when the prophet Agabus was saying, he says, give me your belt. He took him and he said, see the owner of this thing? You are about to be in a world of hurt because the owner of this thing, you're going to run into a lot of trouble and a lot of persecution. This is what Paul said. He says, that doesn't move me. None of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to me that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry that I've received from Christ. There's no way I'm going to make it through the way. Isn't that just, we just read two verses. Look at all that's in there. It's all that's in there. I'll share this last illustration. We'll take up an offering because I got all year to talk about this stuff. Oh, don't worry. We'll teach you how. We'll teach you how. A lot of you, if you've been around Jesus any amount of time, you knew the whole cross thing and crucifixion thing, but can someone please tell me how to do it? It's one thing to go die. It's another thing to go, okay, now this is how you're going to do this. So that it works out and it's beneficial both to you and the Lord. Religious people are so consumed with their death, they have very little resurrection life. The result of a crucifixion is a resurrection. There's errors on both sides. There's errors that just people that beat the daylights out of themselves, still trying to figure out what laws they can't break. And then you got other people that use grace as an excuse for sin. And Paul twice in like 10 verses like, no, you don't keep sinning because of grace, fool. That's not what I'm saying. So you have two extremes, right? <clears throat> but when you find what he was talking about as far as crucifixion, resurrecting life, I'm thinking of one uh, illustration. And then, yeah, we'll just, you're filling up. And see, I'm dying right now because I want to teach until one. No, no, we'll finish up. But it reminds me of a story. True story, because it was, well, me. And some of you have heard this. But I'm going to share it with you again. I once knew a man, whether in the body or out of the body. No, he was in the body, it was me. And all I wanted to do was be a rock star. I'm still really good on guitar. I was almost lost my marriage over it, but I had a studio. I was doing studio work. I was in a band, doing all these things. And the Lord came to me and said, I want you to get rid of all of your music. I'm taking it from you, and I want you to die to everything. It could be anything, whatever's special to you. I don't care what it is. For me, it was that. And I know the feeling. Does anybody in here know those first waves of when God's dealing with you? Get off of me feeling. <laughs> Devil, get away. <laughs> and so anyway, we ultimately had a conversation. And I was playing. I was married. I, had, uh, I was working. Left a beer at the time, and I was still getting four to six hours a day and sometimes eight. Robin would wake up in the morning to take care of Lindsay, and I'd still be up practicing because I knew God was going to make me a musician. And so one day, he told me, he says, son, I don't want you playing guitar anymore. Get rid of it. Sell everything you have. We're not going to get, we'll save that for the next one. I'm warming you up to like this stuff first before he goes and says, sell everything you have and give alms to the poor. <laughs> You're laughing because you know that's in there. Yeah. You know that's in there. But we're going to go easy on you today. But remember, it's disciples learn how to live in resurrection life. You just got to go through this first, right? Okay. So, and I know the feeling. I'm praying in tongues a lot. 
You know, the whole mysteries before God. He doesn't speak to men but to God. Anybody told you tongues is only for the public assembly or to be interpreted is wrong. That's one of four operations of speaking in tongues. The Apostle Paul clearly said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says, he who speaks in an unknown language does not speak to men but unto God. It's another operation. No man understands him, howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. So that's what I was doing until it was no longer a mystery because he's like, this is what you've been talking about. So it's just like, son, I don't want you to play guitar anymore. I want it all gone. Sell everything you got. And I was not happy about it. No one ever said crosses feel great. No one ever said it. But I knew his voice and I knew I wanted him more than anything else. And see, you really don't find out whether he's your Lord until he tells you something you don't want to hear. You know that whole God thing? You can call him God all you want until you disagree with him. Are you still going to do what he said? And so I remember, and I, 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 I thought the last argument I would break out, I knew I'd get God on this one. <laughs> I knew it. I'm going to break out the religious card. Lord, don't you understand how much good I can do for you? I can tour and I can, tur I can lead people to Jesus because they're going to listen to my amazing eight-finger tapping music and they're going to be so blown away on how good I am. Oh, yeah, but for your glory. <laughs> and by the time I got done, you know, there's just something about God. He just doesn't have to say much. And yet he can say volumes. And this is what he said to me. Well, what if I don't want you to do that for me? Man wasn't getting in my way. God was saying, no, you have to die. I want all that stuff out of your life because it's in my way. You're the one that decided, you told me. Now, John Sick, this is your fault. It's your own fault for saying to me, I give you permission to take out of my life whatever you have to so I can serve you. Now I've come to you and I'm telling you what has to go. Are you going to give me a hard time? Thirty, forty years later, I'm not lying. I can go to a guitar center right now and buy any 10 guitars on the rack and it wouldn't even cause me to blink. I have the top of the line studio. I have all the guitars I want. I have all the music. He was always going to give it back to me, but it owned me. And it was, and he still doesn't use me that way. Now I do special music and stuff. He never did use me to do that. But you know what? I'm okay preaching the gospel to you and driving Jess around the world and preaching the gospel to billionaires who are in as much spiritual prison as anybody shoving Narcan in their bodies right now. Because I went to the cross and resurrection life began to take place, he was always going to give it back. And he has. And I got about a third of the way through the notes. And we'll just have to get back next week. Hallelujah, Jesus. Can I warn? I just want to give you guys a heads up right now. Um. And I'm going to illustrate with me first, just so you don't think God's a respecter of persons. Before the fast, God started dealing with me. I was wrong. And here's the thing with blindness. You don't know you're blind. You swear everything about you is right, but you're blind. And even before the fast, I was blind. Now, here's the thing. And you want to know that here's the thing with people who've been around Jesus for a while. Your blindness is not a result of an evil heart. Mark this one down. We'll get to it. Jesus said, the son of man's going to be betrayed. I got to suffer under men, but hey, don't worry about it. I'm going to get back up. What did Peter do? Peter's like, Lord, you can't do that. And what did he say? Satan, get behind me. Good intentions many times are the open door for Satan himself. Peter's good intentions open the door to Satan. 
He only had good intentions. Jesus, you can't do that. He, it was Satan himself that was behind his good intentions. So I shared that to say before the fast. How many of you all are familiar with the parable of the sower? You know that one, right? Okay, you got seed that goes by the, plant, the, uh, the path there. Then it goes on the dirt, springs up right away, but there's no root. Then you got the third one, the weeds grow up and choke it out. And then finally you get to the fourth stage. Fourth stage. And then uh, those are the ones that they hear it, they understand it, and then they begin to produce fruit. Okay? So you got four stages. If you do the numbers, that means only 25% of you are going to produce any kind of fruit, even if it's 30. Just do the law, do the numbers. I'm minding my own business. I wasn't expecting God to say this any more than I'm expecting you to say you just went to Mars and back, okay? And I'm praying in the Holy Ghost, getting ready for that, and I'm excited because I'm ready for change, right? He didn't even wait for the fast. He said, uh, he said uh, you've been choked out, and there's areas in your life that are not producing anymore. Well, pastor, why are you all sharing your laundry with me? Because I don't give a flip what you think. And I want you to know I'm as human just as anybody else is. And that if he's going to deal with me, he's probably going to deal with you. That's why. I'm not ashamed because if it'll help you. Do you know the scriptures are full of mistakes that we learn from? So I'm, I'm going to help you. And I've, I've not been afraid to wear my emotions on my sleeve anyway. Okay? But So God told me, he says, you've been choked out. I said, what doeth thou dost that mean if... See, maybe I'll get somewhere if I speak King James, right? <laughs> How many remembers what chokes off the word? Three things. What are they? Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, lust for other things, good intentions. He said, Joseph, I didn't say it took all those three things at one time to choke the word. It can be any one of the three. You don't have deceitfulness of riches. You're not chasing money. But the cares of this world, you're running your ministry, you're in aviation business, your family. He says, you've gotten so caught up. See, the cares of this world does not have to be evil, but it can be distracting. Write that down. Cares of this world do not have to be, distract, to be evil, but they were distracting. I was, an, I was a grown adult. I'm taking care of the ministry. I'm taking care of AVA. I'm flying all around. I'm taking care of our people. I'm sowing into my now five grandkids. But what happened was, see, it doesn't matter how many hours I'm with the Lord. It doesn't matter. I don't need to go into that. I'm just telling you it became less because of the cares of this world. And there's some things I'm not going to care too much about anymore so that I don't get... Oh, and by the way, here's the thing. If everybody's ever had plants, you unchoke the weeds, it grows back. I'm almost back. Okay? There's a reason why I gave that illustration. Good confession time. Say, I love Pastor Joe. I love Pastor Joe. And I know Pastor Joe loves me. <laughs> There's the anesthetic, right? If I step on your toes, it's your own darn fault. If I say something from the pulpit that's addressing you, it is not my fault. You have that problem. Well, I know you were just talking about, I don't care. What do you think my job is? My job is to make disciples. And look, I fessed up. I already showed you where he, dealt, and I, I've done it before. He did this to me. And I didn't get mad that he called me out. I'm rejoicing that he called me out. And I'm not going to have a church that if something comes from the pulpit, I think he's thinking about me. I'll bet I was. Because we either want God or we don't. We either want to see his power and his glory, or we don't. And he did not want music in my life. 
There are a lot of things he took out of my life. Man, I'll tell you what, skin and bones in the spirit. I'm not doing too bad right now. <sighs> well, you're just going to make me mad. That's okay. Jesus made people mad all the time. He let them stay in the service, but he called them out on it. You hard heart. He healed a guy with a withered hand, and it says and he was angry. And then he called them on it. You can be here mad all you want, but don't get mad at me if I call you out on it. Do you know you're being a baby right now? Why don't you stop? Because if we're going to be disciples, and I, I, Paul said this, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Why am I telling you that? Because God's using me as an example. Look, if he'll do this through me, Okay, he was not afraid to share his humanity. I'm not. But if I'm sharing my humanity, we're all in the same pool, folks. And if it's your turn to get nailed, what's the thing? Buttercup. Buckle up, buttercup. Because I, I want to be used in power. I don't want to just watch it. I want to be used in power. And I'm going to. I have been and I'm going to. Amen? Amen? You would think he was talking about me. I was. Amen. How many times have I said to you guys, I just talk to you the way he talks to me? He talks to me like that. And I love what he said, and we're done. I'll go, let's take the offering. I'm not near getting to where we need to go. Let's finish up. Okay? But re remember, if you've asked God to use you, then it's your fault when he comes to you and says, you need to get rid of this. It's your fault. Let's have a church of disciples because I'm commanded to make disciples. And it starts at the cross. Amen?